Last time on object-oriented programming, we looked at how we could build our classes, and with our blueprint complete, we can instantiate our class to create objects. We also looked at some code, but I didn't really you know, explain the code a lot. I told you we would defer it to this episode. So I'm gonna make true on my promise. Today, we're gonna to define some of the terms within that code that you, know, you may not be very familiar with. And yeah, from there, we can move on. So that's all we're gonna do for our third episode of Object-Oriented Programming. Hello and welcome back to another episode of OOP. So before we really continue into anything else, let's go into our code. Let's look at our code from last time line by line, right? Uh, we'll take this as a good opportunity to recap on some of our basics. And then what we can do is we can move on to define our terms. Recall that in the previous episode, we defined four key terms, attributes, methods, classes, and objects. Now, what we see here is a class definition. Well, at least excluding this part here, which starts to instantiate objects. Recall that a class is essentially a blueprint. It is a definition of what lives inside the objects. And what are the main things that live in an object? Well, attributes up here, which are its variables, the information and states that it holds, and methods, which are the things you can actually do to the object. So this was our ball class. We tried to create a class that, well, represents an individual ball. Its attributes are size and color. So for each ball, we can have a unique size and color. And because we want to be able to kick the ball, we need to somehow represent its position. So we created an additional variable here, which can be used in conjunction with the kick function to change and track the position of the ball. So that's the idea. Also on top of this, we had a display function, which will just print out for us the size, color, and position of the ball. We tested this code by instantiating a new ball. Remember the definition of that term? Instantiating an object means using a class that is of course the blueprint to actually build or construct an object. So once we've constructed our ball B, we can start to perform whatever actions we wish. For example, we can kick it first and then display where it is. As you can see, the output tells me that, yeah, the ball has been positioned at position 3. So that is where we stopped last time. I told you that there were several terms that we haven't really seen, and today I'm going to introduce them to you, in particular the terms public and private. In fact, the keywords private and public help to enforce something called visibility. Here's the idea. You have, of course, your object. It doesn't exist on its own, right? It needs to be sitting in a block of code that calls it. For the purposes of this discussion, let's call it outside code. And that is code that lives outside of the object. Of course, within your object itself, you would have your private and public stuff. These can be any combinations of attributes and methods. Here is the idea. Your outside code can interact with anything marked public in the object. So examples like our kick function, these being marked public, can be accessed from outside, no problem. However, if the outside code tries to directly access something that is marked as private, they will not be able to do so. There will be some kind of error or complaint. In order to access that stuff, you have to go through some channel designed to be public. So what this means is you can still have some public methods acting as middlemen for you to access the private variables. That is the idea in a nutshell. But unfortunately, because I did not plan ahead for this, um, some things are a little bit weird at this point, and we have to make some changes in order to see this. I will actually explain the mistake I made a little bit later, but for now, we'll just go ahead and shift our program as needed so that things will actually work for this demonstration. Here are the couple of steps that we need to do. Firstly, take away the public from here. Rename the file so that it is now called my program, like so. Then 
we're gonna create a new class at the bottom this shall be the public class and of course it needs to have the same name as the file name finally let's move our main function over to the new class so these couple of steps i'm gonna do without explaining just yet but we're gonna test it out so we're gonna go ahead and compile the code now it's under the new name now so you have to make sure that you know this is updated accordingly press enter it compiles we try to run it again under the new name and yeah everything works as we expect for now let's focus our attention on the differences between public and private as you can see in this context we have no problems accessing kick and display that is of course because these functions have been set to public so outside code can call it just fine but what if we try to do something a little bit different what if we try to print out say the position of the ball so b.pos like this watch what happens when i try and compile the code now i immediately get an error the position variable has private access in ball what this means is yeah you're not even allowed to compile your program because your program is trying to access something that it has no access to watch how i can stop this from being a problem I can simply set this to public. Now, if I try to compile again, you will see no errors. If I try and run it, the value is indeed displayed. So that's the difference between private and public. And I'm going to go ahead and set this back because uh, private is more appropriate here. And we'll see the reason why very soon. Now, if you recall, when we are talking about the advantages of OOP, another point we've mentioned was data hiding. This is data hiding. By setting your attributes to private, you are preventing the outside world from being able to read or change them. Now, why do we want this? Of course, for security purposes, definitely if you want to you know, make something confidential or protect it, that's how you would do it. But from a software engineering perspective, there is also some value to this. You see, if a value cannot be changed from outside, what that means is you have more guarantees that it's going to be valid. Usually what happens is we set up some methods and yeah, if the outside world wants to change the values, they would have to go through our methods. This means the values cannot be changed on us. We always are aware that the values have changed, right? And if the values are going to change to something that uh, we deem invalid, we can reject that request to change it and keep its old value. That's why data hiding in OOP is so valuable. Now, I ought to explain some of the, you know, big changes I made in the code earlier. And in order to explain that, I need to come back to this picture first. We saw that code outside of an object is only able to change the public, but not the private stuff. But where is this code actually defined? It is, of course, within the class. And what this means is to make this picture more concrete, we can relabel these two parts to this stuff being within the class and this stuff being outside the class. Whatever is outside a class cannot access the private stuff from within the class itself. What this means is you may see why I've had to make big changes to my code just now. Barring the file name change, this was our original code. Now, if I were to change this such that this actually accessed you know, the private variable, that actually would not break. If I request it for the value of b.position, this is actually fine, even though it's still not really working correctly, because b.position is within the class, right? All this is the same class. That's why I had to break this out to a completely different class. That's why I had to create a new class like this and put my main function in here. Now that this statement and this actual variable in which it's referencing is in completely different classes, I can show you how the program trips up. However, I've had to change two things. If I just did this, Java doesn't know how to find the main function within this class. And as a result, it just tells me, hey, I don't really know how to start running this program. As it turns out, Java uses the same keyword public on a class to define the entry points for the program. Of course, by making this change, I would have to rename the file itself as well. 
And because of this, Java now knows to basically start the program here. This class is just a helper class within this page of code, but it is not the main entry point. So I'm sorry we've had, you know, a little bit of a messy change here, but moving forward, I think we can stick to this template. The idea is that we have our class and a separate class that actually calls it, that actually drives our program. Now, I know we haven't discussed the method side of things yet, but I know I've given you a little bit of a teaser as to how they're supposed to work. So we'll look at that in the upcoming episodes. For now, however, it's time for our homework. Let's give this a try, okay? Essentially, here's the idea for the thing we want to build at the end of the day. We want to build a simple spaceship game. We're going to have a bunch of spaceships. They're going to do battle with each other. The winner gets rewards, which they can use to upgrade their ship. So yeah, that's the general gist of things. And let's start by building our class. Let's start by putting the attributes in the right place first. You don't have to worry about the methods. The methods will come along later. Right. And uh, yeah, essentially, this is what you need to do, right? These are the things you need to integrate into your spaceship class. I will be talking about the solution in Java, but again, this isn't a Java course, so feel free to build this in or Python or C++, whatever. And yeah, in a future episode, we will basically compare answers, right? And we'll see how we've approached this problem differently. Anyway, that's it. That's all there is for this episode. Thank you very much for watching. Have fun with our little homework, right? Thank you very much for watching today's episode. Until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment, and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.